We are live on YouTube. And ready to talk about the Australian Open. Hey guys, welcome back to the tennis vlog. And the first live stream I've done on here since I think the French Open was the last time we did these. I wasn't really uploading during Wimbledon because I was there. And then US Open, we didn't do them, but you requested for them to be brought back. So I listened to you and here they are. So for this, I will need your questions. So I know not everyone will be able to be here in time and watching it live, but some of you sent me some ahead of time. So I was going to get them up, but I decided I'd better start the stream because I was running late anyway, which is as per usual. And keeping in theme with the Australian Open because none of the matches actually start at the scheduled time. So, I mean, they've got to walk on and everything. I never understand why with matches they don't actually give the real start time, they give the time when the players walk onto court. So yeah, I, I gave you a time ahead of time just to fit the theme, clearly. Um, oh, I was on the right thing. Anyway, welcome to everyone who's watching live, and for those who aren't watching live, feel free to catch up with this when you can. Do catch up with this when you can. Ah, uh, here we go, there's some comments on here. Can you let me know, please, whether you can hear me because the sound isn't always great and if you can see me properly. Oh, fantastic, questions coming in, great. So I'm, I take it that you can, uh, fab, that's great. So I'll be doing one of these videos after the, each of the first four rounds, basically. First round, second round, third round, fourth round, and then we'll get into more preview and predictions videos just so that you know which results aren't going to happen because I'll predict those ones clearly. And let's start by talking about some of the results that have occurred over the first few days. It, it, my stream is buffering, and I'm sorry if this happens because the Wi-Fi here is dreadful absolutely dreadful. So if this stream crashes, I'm going to be so annoyed. Yeah, laggy stream. I might have to restart. Uh, terrible, terrible Wi-Fi. Let me know if it starts up again. Uh, bonkers. Okay, so it's fine for some, not fine for others. It's not fine for me. I've got one playing in the background to make sure that it's actually working. So, uh, many notable upsets. And this is strange for a Grand Slam, especially on the side. I think a host of the top names fell out at the US Open. But they've been coping pretty fine. Simona Halep um, came close to defeat earlier to match of her US Open first round with Kaya Kanepi. It was actually playing out the same way. Kanepi was coming forward, being aggressive, being attacking and dictating the points. And Halep was getting pushed around. She went down a set and a break. And then as she did in New York as well, she pulled it back. In New York, when she was back on serve, she then absolutely flunked the last game and lost the match in straight sets. But here she was able to turn it round and that is massive mentally for Halep because I believe she came into the tournament on a five match losing streak, which is not what you expect from the world's number one ranked tennis player. She also split with her coach Darren Cahill over the off season and Cahill has been instrumental in what Halep has achieved and enable enabling her to be comfortable on the course and really fulfill her potential. So there's been a lot of changes for Halep. Uh, th this is still buffering on, on mine. I'm gonna refresh the page and see if it makes any difference. Okay, now it's fine. Right, so yeah, good win for Halep. Good win also for Novak Djokovic, top seed on the men's side. It looks straightforward, 6-3, 6-3, 6-2, 6, six, uh, six, 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 over Mitchell Kruega, but, there were some long juice games, there were some tight moments, and credit to the qualifier, he really brought it to Djokovic, but Djokovic just very composed, relaxed, uh, great point construction. Djokovic doesn't always go for the winner straight away, he will set himself up so that it looks like he's going for a, for a winner, make the opponent play the shot he wants them to, and then finish it off. For example, today, at one point he was at the net, uh, he, he volleyed to the left, uh, 
Kruego was there, tried to pass him. Uh, Djokovic had already run. He was ready for it, and he he sent a cross-court winner instead. So Djokovic looking impressive. Straight sets wins also for Nadal and Federer, who played yesterday. Nadal was playing James Duckworth, wildcard from Australia, and he came alive at the end of that match. He suddenly decided to leave it all out there. And Nadal coped with that very well, very strategic with the serves, serving wide, keeping him off the course, and then um, coming in, closing, finishing it off. Very good placement with the serve and volley tactic that Duckworth was throwing at him. He was pinpointing Duckworth as he was coming forward. So very good presence of mind from Nadal. Federer, I didn't watch his match completely because it was happening at the same time as Murray was obviously playing that massive match. So didn't see that one. I, I can't comment too much on it really because I do need to go back and watch a bit more, but by all accounts, Federer was fine. He played a really good tournament at the Hopman Cup. And even though it's an exhibition event, that kind of thing is key for Federer. It allows him to loosen up. And when it's not a, a tournament that's counting for ranking points, prize money, etc. It just enables him to be more relaxed. And I think that kind of tournament for him and Serena Williams, who steamrolled through today, that's important for them heading into a slam. So enough of me talking about what's been going on. I'll get to answering some of your questions because that's probably what you've come here for. And let's see what's been going on in the chat. Oh, so many questions. Thanks, guys. Uh, fantastic. Do you think is the first question. Uh, this is Barry. Hi, Barry. Do you think Venus will have a better 2019? I think this is opposed to last season where she was playing really well in 20... I'm lo I've lost track of the years now. 2017 had a great year, two Grand Slam finals. And then last year, she kind of took a step down, maybe suffering the after effects of having such a successful year. Uh, do you think Venus will have a better 2019? Came to the net 38 times today, missed that stat, won 30 points there. Also, I believe her first round was their highest quality. Um, I did watch Venus today. I didn't watch it from the beginning, but I watched a lot of it. She, more impressive for me, really, than the, the standard of tennis that Venus played was the grit she was able to show today. She was down a set and a break against a player who's very good from the baseline, can mix it up. Mihaela Bazanescu, if you don't know her, she's Romanian. She's seeded at the Australian Open, but a year and a half ago, she was ranked, I think, outside the top 300 or something crazy. I, I interviewed her in the summer and I have a really good interview that she did with me on my website. Her interview was good. I'm, I'm not praising myself. It was her, her quotes were great. Uh, and she's, uh, she's a very talented player. So Venus was up against it. Um, but when she was down and Bazanescu was serving for the match, you saw Venus take a deep breath, focus, and then she just came out with such consistency. And I was very, very impressed because these are the kind of match situations that Venus has really struggled with over the past year. So I think that's really positive for Venus, but also the way after she won the tie break that ensued because she got back on serve in the second set. Uh, I think that because of the way she was able to sustain her form and really go for it in the final set, it makes her a threat, I think, at uh, the Australian Open. I wouldn't have her down as a title contender this time just because of the form she's had coming into the event. Uh, but I think that she's capable of more wins. Uh, will she have a better year this year? I think this win was key for her. It would have been very difficult for her to go into the rest of the season knowing that she'd lost already this year, that she's now lost her first round at the Slam. But no promising signs from Venus and she still has the talent. She's Second most, um, let's reword that. Serena Williams has the, the most Grand Slams of active players on tour, and then Venus is the next down, and that's no coincidence. No, she's not won a slam in a while, but she was guessing those big results again year before last, so never write Venus Williams off. I think she's definitely capable of good things this year. So that's that question. And... Oh yeah, please comment on Halep's performance, form, and predict how far she'll go. Okay, so we've got a three-part question here. Uh, I talked about Halep a bit before with the way she combated Kinepi. It was concerning, I think, for Halep at the beginning of the match because it was a virtual replay of New York. 
and Kanepi was very dominant, very precise. And honestly, there didn't seem like much Halep could do about that. Could she have been a bit stronger on serve? Yes. But when it came to Kanepi's serve, she was backing it up so immediately and so ferociously that there was no real way for Halep to get in. Even the best defense is, I, th I think, even the best defense is probably not going to win when an attacking and an aggressive game is on point. So that was concerning, but what Halep did incredibly well is hold on and just wait for her moment. The game is 50% mental, in my opinion, and Halep displayed great mental strength, kept her emotions in grip. Even after making it close in that first set and losing the tie break, she didn't let that get her down. Uh, obviously, she was frustrated at times, but I think she was able to channel that into her game. Kanepi did start to miss, which was helpful, but the fact is that Halep waited for that moment. She waited for that opportunity to come through, and um, Kanepi was struggling, I think, with a blister on her hand, and that was difficult for her. But, yeah, great stuff from Halep, and I think that makes her a strong contender, actually, for the title. She's in the most jam-packed section of the draw, which I'll come on to in a moment. So I, I, she wouldn't be my first pick to win, but she's definitely got the game, the weapons, the mentality to go deep again. Obviously, she was a finalist here last year, and I think that made her first round comeback even more impressive because knowing she had those points to defend, she was still able to hang tight and come through. So great stuff from her there. Uh, form obviously wasn't great coming into the events, but I think she can play her way into form. She's got a decent second round, but then it gets that much tougher if things play out as they are projected to. So in terms of her prediction, originally, I know that... Slight sidetrack here. I can't think straight. Um, on my website, I did a preview and predictions draw article for the men for the ATP, and I was going to do one for the women as well, but time flies when you're having fun and life gets busy. And so I didn't get round to that. And it's funny because last year, I think it was the other way round and I did the draw preview predictions for the women and not for the men. But I did know who I was, would have predicted and was going to predict. Halep is in a chock, a block quarter of the draw with Serena Williams, Venus Williams, uh, I think uh, Gobini Muguruza and Joanna Conta are in there as well. They play each other in round two. So it's it's tough, especially for someone coming in on the, the kind of losing streak that Halep did. So I I think that if she were to play Venus in round three, if Venus hasn't upped her level by then, I think Halep could get the win there. Uh, but against Serena... I, given the form Serena's in at the moment, if, if she's in a solid mental headspace, I'd be backing Serena there. I actually did, some of you might know Roz Satar, she has a website called Britwatch Sports, and uh, for some of the Grand Slams, me and a few others do a predictions challenge with her, where we uh, predict men's champion, women's champion, dark horses, all that kind of stuff. I'll, I'll put the link on, the link's on my Twitter actually, if you go down you'll find it somewhere. And on that, I predicted Serena to win, and in my little explanation bit for why I did, I said that my gut instinct was actually going for either Angelique Kerber, who is on the other side of the draw, uh, played well here last year, obviously won the event in 2016, has the game to trouble anyone, really, and won Wimbledon, obviously, and also Naomi Osaka, who I, I didn't think I would be predicting her to win the next Grand Slam after the US Open, but she backed that up considerably well, she's got the game to do big things, and she has a great draw as well up until the semi-finals, so technically Osaka should be playing her way into form and growing deep, growing, going deep, but Serena is almost overlooked at this point, she's, she's not on the top of people's lists to win, if that made any sense, and that's usually when Serena thrives, she does play her best tennis usually when people are doubting her. I remember at the Australian Open, I maybe it was 2008, she'd been not playing that much, she was unfit, she wasn't ready to come back, and she heard someone, a, a commentator or a pundit, saying that she had no chance of winning the tournament. That fired her up and she absolutely steamrolled her way to the trophy. So 
Yeah, Ser Serena's up there for me. I think she would probably beat Halep, which would mean that my prediction for Halep, this is very long-winded, isn't it, uh, would be for the fourth round. But it, it is hard to say. It, it's hard to say, um, as all my predictions are, clearly. Right. Um, that was back there. Oh, <laughs> I've pretty much answered this one. What do you think are Angie Kerber's chances of winning the Australian Open? I think they're up there, very high. She has a very decent draw compared to some of the others. In fact, of the top players, like the top, top seeds, I reckon that Kerber probably has the best draw of anyone, which allows her to play her way into form if she needs to. Uh, she's also obviously not afraid of facing the biggest names in the final rounds of tournaments. She and Serena have played two Grand Slam finals now and Kerber has won, no, three. They played three Grand Slam finals and Kerber has won two of them. So very impressive from her. And Kerber was a bit of a late bloomer when you compare her to the other top players, but I think it served her well. She's got that experience and she made her breakthrough. And because of the experience she had before that, being at the top, but not being at the top top, as it were, she she's very uh, calm mentally when, when it comes to taking on her fellow top players. So yeah, good chances for Kerber here, especially given that she's won here before. Okay, Derek. What do you think on Zverev, Alexander Zverev and Stefanos Tsitsipas's mental state right now? Um, Zverev I was very impressed with coming through his first round in straight sets, and maybe I shouldn't be that impressed because it's the sort of thing we should be expecting from him right now, but if you think about it, he won the ATP finals in November, which feels like yesterday, which is already heightening people's expectations for him. And he already had that pressure at the Grand Slams with everyone saying, why aren't you going beyond the quarter finals? Why can't you do this best of five sets thing? And I've said before, it's one thing to win the ATP finals, which is best of three sets, five matches, you can afford to lose one. And, and it's a completely different thing to come and try and win a Grand Slam tournament, Grand Slam title. So I, I think that Zverev could have a tougher draw. Um, he, he's got some, some potential tough ones in there, I think. Uh, there, there's a section that was full of Nick Kyrgios, Milos Raonic, Stan Wawrinka, Ernest Gulbis, and he he meets them in, I think, potentially the fourth round, the winner to come out of that. If it's Stan Wawrinka, he could well have played himself into form. Raonic looked scary good today, uh, very much nailing the serve all over the court, very efficient, dialed in. So Raonic has been trouble in Australia before, so we could see him coming through. Um... But yeah, I think from Zverev's side of things, looking good to start, it's always the pressure starts to tell the further you get into the tournament. And the, the more people talk about his record at slams, whether he likes it or not, the more that's going to start playing on his mind. So we will swear because that's the sort of thing he has to deal with this fortnight. Since, oh, we've gone buffery again. I'll refresh, see if that helps. I don't know if it's frozen for anyone. Um, yeah, but Sisyphus, uh, I haven't watched him that much recently. I watched him quite a bit last year. I think he's done incredibly well with the, the quality that's on tour at the moment to move up the way he has. Uh, obviously, for good reason, people have expectations for him. He's clearly a great player. He's got a nice rhythm when he plays. He can mix it up. Um, he's... I'm not sure about his draw here. If anyone has any thoughts on his draw, let me know because off the top of my head, I can't really remember who he's projected to face where. I think he might be in Federer's quarter. And if he is, I wouldn't expect Federer to have too much trouble with him because, I mean, they have played, I think they played at Hotman Cup. Federer wasn't too, too troubled. Um, refresh the page again because, oh, there we go. It's righted itself. Yeah, the Wi-Fi here, I'm sorry, is terrible. So if it does crash, I'm very sorry. We might just have to end the stream. Um, but I'll do, I'll do my best to answer your questions before that happens. Um, hopefully it's been going okay. So yeah, so they're the thoughts on Zverev and Tsitsipas. Good question. Um, when I have to watch certain players for work purposes, for work I'm doing for other people, it means that I'm not watching so much the lower ranked players that I'm interested in. So need to get back on top of things with Sisyphus particularly. Uh, doo -doo. Where are we at? <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry it's a blurry stream. Usually the picture quality is okay. I don't, I don't know what's 
going wrong. It's the, the Wi-Fi. It's the Wi-Fi's fault. It's Nadal's new servant improvement. Um, if, for those who don't know, Nadal, who has had the age-long same service motion, has this week changed his service motion. Obviously not just randomly, but uh, it's something that he's been working on and implementing into his game. I wouldn't say one way or the other, to be honest, from, from his match, from what I saw of it. I think I was watching his match simultaneously along with some others. Um, it was kind of neither here nor there, really. It was um, it was not a phenomenal amount of difference. It wasn't worse either. So I think the, the more the tournament goes along, maybe if he gets deep enough to play the top players, comes up against them, see if it makes any difference for better or for worse. But no, I, I can't really comment on that at present because I haven't really really seen that much of a difference uh do you think sloan stevens can get to world number one this year as she is quite close um i'm impressed with how stevens has largely backed up that first us open title straight afterwards it wasn't fantastic as most uh, of the WTA players do when they win their maiden slam, she did drop off a bit in the aftermath. But from there, she's picked it up and she has become one of the consistent top players. She is very good defensively, um, quite good on that note. She has a lot of weapons to her game. She can play across all three surfaces. She's been in a hard court final and a clay court final, um, just waiting on Wimbledon now, I guess. But yeah, Stevens is very talented, uh, quite confident as well. You can feel the confidence with her. Uh, can she get to world number one? She wouldn't be my first pick to get to world number one because that uh, requires non-stop consistency, not just at the Grand Slams where she's traditionally performed well from when she was a teenager the slams were kind of she would have her slam magic and then she would go on a wander and not really perform at the lower events. But yeah, she has the potential. She has the talent to to be world number one in the world at some point but I wouldn't put her there just yet personally uh who will win tomorrow <laughs> a very vague open question um well let's think of which side of the draw it is it's uh Kerber and Nadal and Federer isn't it uh who have we got um Federer is playing I can't remember who anyone is playing to be honest have I is that one of my computers has turned off. I had a, had a laptop here ready, just in case I needed to check who was playing who or who'd beaten who. Uh, because it's no good if I'm just sat here saying, oh, I don't know who's playing who or who won what. Um, it's not very helpful. It's not what you've tuned in for. So let's see. I did know this. I just can't remember off the top of my head. Nadal is playing Matthew Webden. So another Australian wildcard. Fully expect him to win that one. I would be surprised if he didn't. Ebden has been a long time on tour, really started stepping it up in recent times, actually. He had a good year last year, probably one of his best. But, you know, you can't compare to Nadal's experience and Nadal's ability, so I definitely have Nadal coming through that particular encounter. Federer, Dan Evans. Wow, how did I forget that one? I, I had to watch the Brits in order to talk about them, because obviously I'm in Britain, everyone wants to know how the Brits are doing. Um, I didn't see much of his match, though, because there were so many other British matches going on. What I will say about Evans is he can throw in a lot of variety. He's a very talented player, maybe not the fittest player, maybe not the best mover, but he does have a lot of weapons, and I, I feel like he can stay with Federer. He's played him at a Grand Slam before, I believe, at Wimbledon, so he's had that experience. Um, who knows, if Federer has a really off day, he could potentially get the upset. I know a few people that are predicting Federer to crash out early, but you know Federer had things under control against Denis Isdemir in the first round. I feel like he played as well as he needed to play, didn't overly exert himself, uh, was doing quite well in that respect. So yeah, I'd, I'd have Federer coming through. Um, who else plays tomorrow? They're, they're the big names playing tomorrow. If you want to know what I think uh, will happen to a particular player, then just leave their name and ask me what might happen to them and I will get to it. Uh, oh, Maria Sharapova came through very strong against Harriet Dart. Dart very much like a deer in the headlights there, a bit nervous. So I think that says as much about where she was at as where Sharapova was. But I mean, you've still got to be in a good place to get a double bagel win, which is positive for Sharapova, who's not been in good form at all since coming since coming back really from the from the drugs ban. I, I Sharapova hasn't impressed me apart from 
when she beat Simona Halep at the US Open, very good standard from her. I think she beat Ostapenko at one point as well, maybe twice. So, I mean, she still has ability. I just think that there are better players than Sharapova on tour right now. And uh, if, if she's to go deeper into the draw, like I felt at the US Open, she was playing okay, but I just felt like it was going to go on until a certain point and she was inevitably going to lose. I'm going to look stupid now if she wins the thing, but I wouldn't have her up there as a title contender, really. Uh, Robin Haas versus Thomas Burditch. Good win for Burditch over Edmund. It was a tough draw for both of them, to be fair. For Edmund, you've really got to feel sorry for him. Uh, semi-final last year, breakout Australian Open semi-final. Came into this year, had an unexpected loss in his first match. Then comes into the Australian Open and hey presto, playing Thomas Burditch, who's made the semi-finals, who's a very experienced, very talented player. When he's landing the big serve, it's difficult to really make an impact. Uh, it's, I mean, it's difficult for the, the most elite, let alone someone lower down. Burditch very motivated due to the fact he's been out a lot with injury. So um, I, I'd have Burditch coming through there. I think if um, after a couple of matches, Burditch might be feeling quite comfortable, might be might be ready to, to cause some upsets later on, but I can't remember where he is in the draw. Let's think. He played yesterday, so it means he's in Djokovic's half. Um, yeah, could get interesting with Burdich. He's a player who's um, super confident. He's He's got the wins over the, the biggest players, multiple wins over each of the big four. So, yeah, keep an eye on Burdich. At the moment, I think, of the big servers coming back from injury, Raonic was very impressive to me today. Um, but he's in a very tough section, so we'll see how he fares against Stan Wawrinka, I believe he's playing next. Um, yeah, that should be interesting. Uh, what do you think about Naomi Osaka's level of play today? I think I touched on this. I think she was efficient. She just got the job done, very focused. I think it was... A blessing in disguise for her that she lost ahead of this tournament in that match against, I think, Lazia Serenko, where she said she wasn't impressed with her own maturity and attitude during the match. Definitely better for her to lose there and see what she needs to work on than come into the Australian Open with that kind of baggage that needs sorting out. So, yeah, I think she's got a good draw. She was in good form, landing her shots, uh, she played Magda Lynette and Lynette, I always think of Lynette as quite a delicate player. That's just what comes to mind when I think of a game. It's very um, delicate. But, um, she's she's not the most powerful player. She's got a nice touch to her. Um, but uh, yeah, I think it was a good start for Osaka, a good draw that she has. And I, I think that she will keep playing her way into good form to face the top players later on. Uh... Best match of round one, and why is it Murray versus a gut? I don't. I don't. Oh, are you saying that it is Murray versus Bautista a gut? I don't know. Well, obviously there was a lot of drama around that match, given everything that Murray'd said. If you follow me on Twitter or something, you've probably seen my thoughts on Murray a lot. I've spoken about it on the radio a fair bit. Um. The the whole Murray drama for the past week kind of came out of the blue. It's torn across the headlines, ripped across them. Uh, briefly, I want to say from from the get go with Murray, obviously he's at a very he's at a big crossroads now because it's kind of the fight between his body, which is maybe saying it's time to bring it to a close, and his inner competitor, which we saw in full show yesterday that's saying to him no carry on I want to carry on and I think that's why he himself is being kind of not very clear with where he's going in future because he's got part of him saying one thing and part of him saying another thing and he doesn't really know who to listen to maybe he's trying to please both at the same time uh, when he first announced his impending departure from the sport he never used the word retire he never used the word retirement. He never used the word retiring, which was something I picked up on immediately because I wasn't at the press conference. I'm still in Britain at the moment, sadly, not in Melbourne. Uh, and all these tweets were coming out of the press conference and differences of opinion, differences of reporting. Someone had tweeted, breaking news, Andy Murray to retire at Wimbledon. And then someone else comes out with the full quote and he hadn't actually said that at all. He'd said that at this point in time, the way he was feeling, 
he felt like he he might like to bring it to a close there. He never said, I am retiring at Wimbledon, full stop. He never said, I am retiring, full stop. Um, but this is where the kind of the business aspects of the media and journalism comes in, because when something big like this happens, you want to get the clicks, you want to get the headlines, and therefore there were all these tributes to Murray, which felt very premature and kind of weird, because he was still very much playing, still trying to compete at a Grand Slam. Um, and he had all these people... I mean, it was lovely, a lot of what was written, and uh, fitting tributes to a player who has been giving his all for so long, 110% to keep up with Djokovic, Federer and Nadal, to step up and take his opportunities when those guys relented. He's been present time and again to to take those moments. But it, it was very much uh, the media jumping onto things and maybe not advertising things in an accurate fashion. I've had people saying to me, uh, is Murray retiring or is he not? Because some people are saying one thing, some people are saying another. Murray himself said after his match that he might try and come back next year. So, yeah, very confusing situation with Murray because I think he's confused himself, really. But going back to the original question, um, <clears throat> yeah, obviously Murray versus Bautista Rigut was a highlight of the first round and not just because of the significance of the match, but because of the quality as well. Bautista Rigut, I, I felt for him really, he, he was very gracious and truly understood the situation, understood why the crowd was backing Murray so ferociously to the point where one guy, I think, cheered for Bautista Rigut and everyone booed him. Um, he was very understanding of that because he knew the situation. But Bautista Rigut obviously won a title uh, in Qatar coming into the Open. He was in good form in Qatar. He'd beaten Novak Djokovic, a shock win there. He'd been very consistent. I spoke about it in my last video, if you're subscribed and you watched it. If you aren't subscribed, subscribe now to keep up with future videos. Put in that plug in. Um, yeah, he very consistent. Uh, great pace on the ball where he was able to up the ante to rip a winner when he needed to. Very comfortable coming forwards in the court. And he showed that again against Murray. He was strategically very good. Uh, he would bring out the drop shot a fair bit when he was in trouble because heartless and cruel though it may have to be, he knew that with Murray's situation, he wasn't going to be able to get all over the court. He wasn't be going to be able to run down a forehand at the far side and then make it to the net to pick up a drop shot. So it was high quality from Bautista Rigurt. Obviously, I think he did wobble a bit partway through. Uh, Murray really rose on the support of the crowd, I think. And in the third set, he just saw two games to look, two games, two sets to love down. And hey, he'd said it could possibly, maybe, potentially be the last match of his career. So leave it all out there and absolutely go for it. Whatever happens, he said he's not competing for another four and a half months until Wimbledon. So he had that liberty and he did. He just chased down everything. He was really exerting himself and Bautista Rigut did have a slight wobble. But I think what was impressive from him was the way he was able to regroup in that fifth set. And however injured Murray is, whatever the occasion of the match, however however much people I don't think expected Murray to win that match, Bautista Rigot was still faced with a three-time Grand Slam champion who's known for his grit, who's known for his ability to come through marathons. And he had to come to terms with the fact that he'd lost two straight tie breaks from being two sets to love up. And he had to deal with that. And I thought he deal dealt with that exceedingly well, which was probably overlooked a bit naturally because of the significance of that match to Murray. But Bautista Rigot is not one to be overlooked. I think this win in particular will give him a lot of confidence. You saw the way he reacted at the end, how pleased he was to have come through. So yeah, great contest there, great match. And um, yeah, I think that that is probably uh, the number one match of round one. It's a, a big collision to have had so early on. And Raonic and Kyrgios had the had the potential to to be close, and it was three close sets. But um, Kyrgios obviously wasn't feeling full fitness there, and Raonic completely locked in. So yeah. Okay, with Andy Murray's injury and possible retirements, I think it's clear for everyone that even the so-called Big Four are vulnerable when it comes to career-threatening injuries. That is true, and I think that because the big four keep going and going, you've got Federer at 37 still competing for the biggest titles, which would have been unheard of 10, 20 years ago. 
um, you kind of feel like because they're always there and because they're always going, they'll just keep going and they'll keep going and they won't stop. And so for Murray to come out with the announcement, hey, uh, there might be an impending retirement, like I might be stopping, the the end might be near, that was kind of a wake up call because no one's careers are going to last forever. And I think maybe even for the the rest of the, the big four, Federer, Djokovic, Nadal, they're, maybe they're going to think now, oh, it's not going to last forever because Murray's been such a close competitor to them that, I mean, I mean that, that has to kind of jolt something for them. Like, hang on a minute, we, we are not going to be here forever. And maybe that will even fire them up to achieve more, potentially. Okay. What do you think about the retirement order of these four players? Oh, great question. Who will finish his career first, second, third and fourth? based on their current physical and mental state. You know, the really interesting thing about this question, I did not, I mean, he's not gone yet. I, I still, as I've said, I think he'll probably, potentially, possibly, keep playing longer than he or anyone else expects to, whether that means he takes a break beforehand or whatever. But I, I never expected Murray to be the first to go um, because he's one of the youngest, because he's not had such a period of domination as the other three have had. They've each had periods where they've been dominating, whether that's on a specific surface or over the season as a whole. Um, he's he's just not had that. But looking back, when I really review things, it actually does make sense because Murray has played such a gritty style. He's had to work harder potentially than the other three in order to in order to keep up with them. So. Yeah, uh, it makes it hard to predict. I, I know a lot of people were saying Nadal to retire early because of the knee injury, because of the wrist injury. I mean, he's had a ton of injuries, Nadal. He's he's just prone to injury. Uh, but the thing is, it, with Murray at the moment, you can see that competitive spirit and that determination and the way tennis has become such a huge part of their life, which means that these players can't just sit down and let it go. They keep pushing their body beyond what it's able to bear. And maybe Murray Sip is just going to say, you know what, however much you want this, that what you want is not enough to get past this injury. But with Nadal, I think time and time again, his ambition and his grittiness has been able to look past the knee injury, look past the wrist injury and see more of a future for himself on tour, which, I mean, I don't think I can predict this. It's too difficult. Um, Obviously, Federer can't go on forever. He's five years older, I think, than Nadal. But he seems to have a body made for playing tennis, made to deal with the rigour of it. And I can see Federer playing into his 40s. I, If he wants it, it depends. I, I'll take a drink here, but... Um, it depends how many Grand Slams I think he wins in the coming months, years. He obviously isn't looking in as great form as he did in 2017 and 2018. It's, it's weird to talk about 2018 as a thing of the past because it was uh, very recent. But yeah, I think for Federer, it's important to do well here, to do well at Wimbledon, because I think Australian Open Wimbledon are the two big ones for him at the moment. Um, but yeah, uh, great question, but a very, very difficult question to answer. And as Murray's situation shows, it is impossible to predict because you never know what's going to happen at any given time. So, yeah. Do you think Alexander Zverev overcame his Grand Slam struggle? Uh, do, I, do I think he will? Um, I don't have any of the younger guys down for winning a Grand Slam this year. They wouldn't be my pick. I'd probably be going for someone like Stan Wawrinka, who I've crazily predicted to make the semi-finals. I'd probably be going for someone like that over someone like, well, Zverev is the leading contender of the younger ones, but over someone like Shapovalov or Dimonor or someone. So I think the the best of five set thing is still a big barrier for the players in that respect because it's it's such a physical game now and for them to have to deal with that over best of five sets, it's just really difficult. Best of five sets, then you've got seven matches. Maybe it helps them more now that they've brought in this uh, crazy final set tiebreak rule. Um, where <clears throat> four Grand Slams now with four different formats. I mean, it's mad. Uh, they're supposed to be 
the prestigious events, the important events, but how can anyone take them seriously if they can't even agree with each other on how to run the sport? So it's a 10 point match tie break uh, in the final set at the Australian Open now, which has already confused a few people. See Katie Bolter, who thought she'd won at 7 4 in her tie break and found out no, she had to win another three points. So being able to compose herself. Hmm. Oh, bring again. What is this? Yeah. I think that Zverev has the strongest chance of the younger players of breaking through, but I wouldn't have him doing it this tournament, and I'm not sure I would have him doing it this year, really. Um, I've just had to refresh my page, so I've got to wait a bit to get the questions back, and also I did have those... This computer keeps turning itself off. Fantastic. I had the questions that were sent in ahead of time, people who weren't going to be here... So, in fact, before I move on, before I forget, I will get to answering them now. Um, all right, I think someone asked one again. We've already talked about Tsitsipas and Zverev. Um, another one just says, who do you think will make a breakthrough this season? Here particularly, I mean, there's lots of players that have potential. Diana Yastrzemska, who is a young WTA player, beat Sam Stoza today, which, I mean, despite the fact that probably still not many people know her, uh, wouldn't be too much of a shock because poor Sam Stoza has really struggled playing at the Australian Open. I always feel very sorry for her because so many of the Australians and other people who, who are of the nationality of the home Grand Slam, they really look forward to playing there, to having the crowd behind them. It's something that they relish, but for Stoza, it just seems to be a bit of a burden for her. And so many years of losing early at the Australian Open, it really has to play on her mind and be a real real mental battle for her. So um, there are other players. I, th I feel like there's a whole group of players like Diana Yastremska, which includes Anastasia Potapova, um, uh, Name is gone. She won a she won a title last year, seventeen. Begins with D, and uh, surname ends with K. Begins with K. Never mind. Um, I'll know her the moment I I go off the stream. I keep thinking Danka Kovinic. That's not. But I mean, like I say, there's um. There's a lot of younger players on the WTA side that are all fighting to come through together. A lot of them have similar game styles. So any number of them could do something at this particular tournament. I think Belinda Bencic, as I tweeted earlier, I think is very close to getting back to where she was. As a teenager, she broke into the top 10. She beat, I think, six straight or seven straight Grand Slam finalists to win her maiden Premier Mandatory title, which was brilliant was so good and for whatever reason players do have a problem with her game and breaking through against her and after a string of injuries she's looking to come back strong so Bencic is not the youngest she's older than Osaka who has won a slam uh, but she's had her problems and I, I think that we could be seeing a good run from Belinda Bencic she's my dark horse really on the the women's side uh, and in terms of the men, Riley Apelka got a great win over John Isner in round one. Uh, if you don't know much about Apelka, he is a younger uh, American guy. He was kind of in a group, age group-ish, with Taylor Fritz and Tommy Paul. And of, of the three of them, Taylor Fritz is the only one that has had, like, extended success, I guess, on the ATP tour. Tommy Paul had um, a flash of good form in the 2017 US Open, uh, US Open, sw US Swing, American Swing, he was getting some good results there. And now it seems like it might be Apelka's turn to, turn to kind of make a splash. He's very tall, he's almost seven foot tall. So I don't know if anyone's ever seen him in real life, but he's seriously a giant. You, you sit there on court and you think, how is anyone supposed to get past this guy? Well, well, he can cover the court in a couple of strides. You know, he's he's massive at the net. So it's a big advantage to him. It's all about, I think it sometimes comes down to the movement with the top players. Tall, yes, is an advantage, but it does make it harder to move. So see how he handles that. I'm not sure what his draw is like, as I think I've said about a million times on this video. But uh, no, to, to get that win over Isner, who... Had a great year last year, obviously won the Miami Open. That's great for him. Oh, fantastic for him. He's got Fabiano in the second round. And Thomas Fabiano is a good player, but I mean, he was playing challenges last year, year before last year. So 
that's um that's a winnable match for Apelka, and maybe we'll see him making some strides this tournament. Uh, oh, thank you for the compliment. Uh, let's go back up a little bit. Uh, where are we up to? Any top seeds you think could go out early? Don't apologise for being late. I was late myself. Um, who do I think might go out early? I was concerned about Halep for her, um, given that she had this matchup with Kanepi and when Kanepi was dominating at the US Open, there didn't seem to be much that Halep could do. Um, given that she's got a tough draw, I guess Halep is, if she falls against Serena, she'll be going out well ahead of her top seeding. So I think, yeah, Halep could still be out early, uh, but I wasn't fully convinced by that. So on this predictions thing I did, I actually put Caroline Wozniacki down. Uh, she's the third seed, probably, I mean, she probably has a fairly decent draw compared to some players. But uh, just the fact that she hasn't been incredibly successful of late, um, it feels like a long time ago that she won that first Grand Slam. Uh, she's a counterpuncher, so if she comes up against uh, an aggressive, attacking player who's really landing their marks, I think she could be in trouble. So I think potentially Wozniacki could be in danger early on. Uh, maybe third round, fourth round exit for Wozniacki. Um, on the men's side, it's a lot harder to call. Now, if, if you've read my draw preview and prediction, you'll see that I've predicted Novak Djokovic to win, which seems the obvious choice, which I thought I would be predicting when he won the US Open, I there's a part of me, as I've said, that can see Djokovic winning the calendar slam this year, if not the first two slams to mean that he's won. Well, no, I see Nadal winning the French, to be honest. But I mean, he, he's got the potential to, to win the calendar slam. Um, but he's got a very tough draw from now. I mean, he plays Joe Wilfred Songa in the second round. And Songa, very pleased for him because he got the straight sets win today in his first Grand Slam match since... The Australian Open last year, um, first Grand Slam win, because he's had so much injury, he's ranked pretty much like on the edge of the top 200 now, Songa. Uh, but he played he played a good match against um, Martin Klesan, who is a very dangerous player. He's hot and cold, but he definitely has ability. So that's a really good win for Songa to get in straights, under pressure in the big moments. He was there. Djokovic is a different story, a very different kettle of fish, um, because Djokovic has had so many wins over Songa. He absolutely devastated him with that win at the 2012 French Open when in the quarterfinals, Songa had four match points, I believe, and lost in five sets to Djokovic. So it's never over till it's over with him. And I think the more that Djokovic plays, the more comfortable he will feel the more top players he faces early on and beats, the better for him going deeper into the draw. And I think that if he gets through his first rounds, then he probably will win the title and will probably not be troubled by the likes of Federer, maybe. It depends how Federer plays himself, really. But yeah, the, the reason I was talking about him just then was because I, I thought potentially, you know, Djokovic, even though I predicted him to win, could have an early shocker. But do I have that confidence in Songa? I just don't know if he can string together that consistency at the moment, to be honest. He has he has the potential, he has the talent, as, as we've seen, because he's beaten Djokovic before. He's beaten all of the big four previously. But um, I don't really see it happening, I don't think. But it might. <laughs> Just covering myself. Um, yeah, it might. It, it might happen. Uh, Federer. Oh, Federer. Djokovic or Zverev. Djokovic or Zverev. Because so they're, they're projected to face off in the semis. A few people were confused by this in my draw preview because at the beginning of each quarter when I write a draw preview I write the projected semi-final. Now the projected final is not my prediction, that is what the semi-final, quarter-final even, sorry, that's what the quarter-final should be by way of seeding, e.g. Zverev should by seeding face Dominic Team in the quarters because that's the way the seeds have fallen, um, but then I've predicted Stan Favrinka to get through that quarter, that's my prediction. My My prediction is not team versus Zverev in the quarters. That's the projection, if that makes sense. 
I don't know why I was talking about that. What's the question? Oh yeah, uh, Djokovic versus Zverev. Uh, who would win? At a Grand Slam, I'd take Djokovic 100%. I know that Zverev beat him at the finals, but it's best of five again. And I, I don't really think that Zverev will make that point. Maybe this will be it. Maybe this will be the slam where he gets to the semis. Um, but I, I would take Djokovic in that. Uh... I have a feeling Stan Wawrinka might go deep in this tournament. He seems to be under the radar. That was my thought process when I had to pick a dark horse from the draw. And the, honestly, in terms of his form and how he's playing at the moment, there is no real reason to pick Wawrinka because he's been struggling since he's had all these injuries. He's not been picking up the results the same way he has been. He's had some tough draws early on that have hindered him. Uh, but... I think with Vavrinka, the reason I picked him was because of his form previously at this event. Um, because of obviously he's won here. This is where he made his really big breakthrough. He's had great clashes with Djokovic here, one of which he lost, one of which he won. So uh, looking at that, I mean, obviously Vavrinka does have the talent to come through, but it's just a case of whether he can string it together. I think it's a good test for him really to have the tough opponents that he does early on. Because that because that means that he can kind of play... If he comes through them, he's been tested and he, he it will kind of force him to bring some of his better tennis, if you know what I mean. So, yeah. Best underdog so far is the next question. Best underdog. Well, the Vrinka, I guess, is a bit of an underdog. But he had a helping hand getting through his first match. Because today, when he played Gulbis, uh, he actually lost the first set and then... He was up a break in the second set. Gulbis took a medical timeout and retired. So that's a help for helping hand for Vavrinka. Um, in terms of... I mean, there are many underdogs. I guess anyone that's not seeded is an underdog. Um, maybe if we're talking about dark horse contenders, Arena Sabalenka, I think, is an outside contender for the title. Uh, some, I think someone asked a question for that. Yeah, the next question is how far do you think Arena Sabalenka will go? I think she can go deep. Um, she... I think it's been quite open about the fact that she has big ambitions. She's very buoyed and confident by the fact that she was able to win her first tournament of the year as the top seed. She won her first Premier title last year, her first WTA title, soared up the rankings. And it's been a very steady, progressive journey for her. And maybe it is a bit too soon to break out at the Australian Open here, but she does have a decent draw. And uh, she plays, I think she plays um, Katie Bolter next. And that's a massive step up for Bolter because, yes, it was a good win for her. Uh, for those that don't know Katie Bolter, she's a Brit, which is why she gets a lot of publicity. And she's ranked world number 97 at the moment. And she beat Ekaterina Makarova in the first round in the first ever super tiebreak to be played. Briefly on Bolter, I thought that she played decently. She's got a strong forehand and she was really going for the lines and going for the depth on the baseline with it. And she, she played great. She was, in that respect, she was very gritty when it mattered. In the latter stages, when it was kind of almost too close to call, she hung tough. She composed herself very well when she thought she'd won that tiebreak and she hadn't regrouped. So she's she's got a lot of talent. I'm surprised people didn't spot her earlier when they were looking at the promising rising British youngsters is she's 22 it's taken her she's a bit more of a late bloomer than the likes of Heather Watson Laura Robson who I mean Robson had reached a Grand Slam fourth round in her teens um uh, not doing so well now but yeah but Bolter is a decent player but Makarova I think was very forgiving of her errors in that match because Makarova is a complete shadow of the player that she was when she was beating Serena Williams here, when she was making the semi-finals here, she's done previously, or quarter-finals. Uh, she, she's not that kind of player anymore. She's got all the potential to be. She's a dangerous lefty, but she was just full of unforced errors against Bolter. She didn't offer a lot of resistance at times, and Bolter was making key unforced errors as well, but because of the way Makarova was playing... It were, Makarova was just kind of forgiving that whereas when Bolter comes to face Sabalenka she's not going to have that same situation I think Sabalenka if she's in form if she's in the form that got her through the first round so convincingly she she will punish Bolter for those errors so I definitely see her guessing past the second round uh, Sabalenka and I 
as I've said before, I think she can she can go deep. And she's the eleventh seed, so seeding suggests that she should be going deep, really, even even though she hasn't massively before. Worth remembering as well with Sabalenka that she was the only player to trouble Naomi Osaka at the US Open. She was the only player to get a set off Osaka. So Osaka was in great form at that point in time, so that tells you something about the way Sabalenka can compete and play. Right, we're nearly at the hour mark, so I think I'll probably do five minutes more and then call it to bring it to a close. Uh, the next stream will not be at the same time on Thursday because I'm busy midday Thursday afternoon. So I, I will be doing one on Thursday, but I'll have a think about what time to do it and let you know. Let me know what time would be good for you. Uh, it's difficult because I know I have the audience for the tennis vlog it's great you're all over the world which is fantastic i think it's awesome that so many people from so many different places can share the love of this sport uh, but it does make it difficult scheduling live streams and trying to put it at a time when a lot of people can tune in so uh, i'll do my best um but i'm sorry if it turns out to be inconvenient on thursday uh let's go down okay some of the players you have seen in person that stand out most women and men. Uh, let's relate this to the Australian Open and talk about players that are here. Mm. I first saw, uh, that's a, a notification to say that Benoit Paire has just taken the third set against Team, the only match still going on in Australia at the moment. Team was two sets to love up. And it's, I think it's sidetrack, an important match for Team to win because he's not being in fantastic form given his seeding and he's definitely not a front runner for the title here so which he could be and maybe even should be because he's talented um but going back to that um i saw naomi osaka live a long time before she came became relevant and um i was sat courtside watching her because i knew what she was going to be i interviewed her a couple of times and i remember talking to her after like one of her first matches on grass courts and she was so depressed because she uh, she pretty much got wiped off the court and she was saying I should be playing well on grass courts but I'm not used to them and uh, I can't cope with the, the just the whole the whole deal of having to I think bend down get lower be faster because of the pace and because of the way the ball is bouncing um, but you, players like that, even if they can't quite put it together yet, you can tell that they're going to be something special. Alexander Zverev as well. Uh, first time I saw Zverev live, he was on an outside court. I might have told this story before. And um, uh, I, I knew who he was, obviously. It was in Great Britain, so uh, a lot of the spectators there aren't up to date with tennis and not outside of the top players, so they wouldn't have known a lot of lower-ranked players. Uh, this was at the point that everyone was kind of hyping up Borna Choric, who is fantastic but at that point I was I thought Zverev would be better just because I thought um, his game contained more potential weapons whereas with Chorich he was very solid but I didn't I didn't think he had the the potential lethalness that Zverev had and Zverev is coming through more quickly now um, but yeah I think Zverev was like 17 18 and he was on the outside course and um, his, his brother Misha and his dad uh, was sat on the bench, uh, I'd just seen Misha on TV a, a few weeks before playing on grass, and I, I just loved his game, serve and volley and all of that. It was, it was fab. So I, I went and sat next to them watching Zverev, and it was so obvious that he was going to be good. So big serve, big ground strokes, but it was all about being able to put that together consistently and look at the potential he had and build on that. So, yeah, I remember seeing those two and thinking they had great potential. Um, I remember seeing Alex de Menor also live in Britain in qualifying for a challenger. Um, maybe I even watched him live before Leighton Hewitt did. But it was, yeah, it was, it was in uh, Nottingham a couple of years ago. And, yeah, he was playing in qualifying and... He lost the match, but you could see he was so speedy, obviously, he could get all around the court and you could just sense that, given time, he could break through. And actually, it was um, half a year or so after that that he didn't make his breakthrough um, on the ATP. I think he was ranked outside. He was probably ranked around 300 when I saw him. And then, uh, obviously, he's worked his way right up now, won his first ATP title last week. 
at the Australian Open, I think it, what is great for Dimonor here is that he's not playing doubles. He was supposed to be playing doubles, but now he's not because he's focusing and prioritizing so much his singles game, which is great to see that focus because he clearly believes that he can do well here. Um, and uh, having won, I think it was Sydney that he won, obviously he's going to be tired. Um, on that note, I do not understand why any title contender, not that, not that Dimonor is a title contender, but I don't understand why title com contenders would ever compete the week before a Grand Slam because you're potentially playing a whole week and then going on to potentially play a whole fortnight. So you, you're really wearing yourself out ahead of the big event. So I, I don't understand the logic or the thought process behind that unless the player has recently been injured and needs match play. Um, but no sensible stuff from Dimonor. He uh, has the potential to do big things in this draw. I think given the fact that he's so speedy and he can stay in a lot of long rallies, best of five sets. I can't see him winning like a load of them in a row, but I think that as opposed to some of the other younger players, he can probably cope better with this format. Uh, so, but yeah, that's enough answers for that question. Uh, let's have a look. Whatever happened to Felix Algier Aliassim? Good question. Uh, he played the US Open. He played first round against Denis Shapovalov. In fact, I do believe in the Q&A video that I did at the beginning of this year, I called him as one of two players that I thought could make a breakthrough this year, him and Yosuke Watanuki. Um, but yeah, uh, Alja Ali Asim, he played a really good match against Denis Shapovalov at the US Open. Shapovalov has raved about him, said about his potential, uh, but he had to, he was very tearful actually and upset because he had to pull out of that match with cramps, which was very unfortunate for him. Uh, I'm not sure he might have been in qualifying for this tournament. Let's have a look, shall we? Have a look at what he's been up to lately. But no, he's got a great amount of promise. He can play really good aggressive tennis. Um, Shapovalov compared him to Songa, and I can see that definitely a very booming aggressive game, big serve, big ground strokes. Yeah, he played Australian Open qualifying and uh, he lost to Christopher Eubanks in the second round of qualifying. Eubanks had a good campaign in the main draw because he qualified. He's a tall guy from America, uh, 22 years old, very has the ability to be very lethal. And he played uh, Nikolas Vazilashvili, the number 19 seed in the first round. I saw parts of that match. Competed really well. He's got that big serve. He's got... An effortless looking one-handed backhand, really, and he can hit the forehand well as well. For Eubanks, it's about bringing the consistency up. So I'm not surprised to see that Alja Aliasim lost that match because that's a very tricky match with um, a player that he's probably encountered quite a bit before. So one of them from Canada, one of them from America. So... Yeah, I, I think that he can still make a breakthrough this year. Obviously, you're going to have tough draws at slams and you've just got to take that on the chin and move on, really. So, okay, right. If anyone has any last questions, then send them now. If not, I'm going to wrap this up. Uh, thank you, everyone, very much for tuning in and watching. Thank you for your questions. I've enjoyed it. Uh, these live streams are, are great uh, and I will be doing them for the rest of the first week so yeah uh, there haven't been really any massive upsets to talk about um which i think people have overlooked in because there's been so much attention on murray which this time last year would have been or two years ago would have been a massive upset but it was almost something that people expected to happen i i predicted for him to go out round one because he was playing roberto bautista or good it's tough uh, but yeah, the the seeded players on the whole, credit to them, have done very well to um, to sustain their form. Um, yeah, we've already spoken a bit about Halep, so if you skip back to the beginning of the video, we had a, a little bit of talk about her. But yeah, where, where can it improve? I think for Halep, the thing she can always improve is the serve and the consistency behind it and the uh, the power and the the variation on it i think the serve is some is the the serve and the return are two things that all players can look to improve um yeah because they're they're the key things really i've had uh pe people who i've done tennis with before 
and it's been saying that really 50% of the time you spend practicing should be spent on this serve and the return because if you don't get your serve in and if you don't get your return in you're not going to have the opportunity to play those ground strokes to come up and execute those volleys so they're the two important elements of the game and for Halep and for anyone they're the things to be working on but I think particularly the serve. Okay, uh, thank you to you for tuning in. Thank you everyone for joining. Uh, if you haven't caught this live, don't worry, it will be up on the main channel and you can watch it back. And yeah, thank you very much for your questions and I hope you enjoy round two of the Australian Open. See if we have any particular big upsets to, to talk about. And yeah. That's it. Thank you for watching. Subscribe if you haven't. Turn your notifications on. It's the little bell button at the side of the subscribe button because apparently if you just hit subscribe you don't get notifications for every video but if you hit the bell then you will and you should get notifications when I'm going live as well. So I'm um, just gonna have a, a, a look at how I will turn this off. Yep there we go. Over an hour I think we've done well. Um, thank you to anyone who's in Melbourne or somewhere and has stayed up into the early hours watching this. Uh, appreciate you all being here. Uh, have a good day, enjoy the tennis 